this is the, the later prophetic period. So this picks up right where Revelation 2 left off in our chronology. So let's go ahead and look at our handout that uh, Jim, Jimmy has a, uh, supplied for the PDF. And let's look at Sardis. In the yellow, you'll notice that yellow we have the preamble. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. That's him saying, this is who I am. In blue, we have the historical prologue. This is him saying, this is what I expect of you. Or this is how we got here, excuse me. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. In green, we have ethical stipulations. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Verse 3, be, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. In pink, we have the sanctions. If therefore thou shalt not watch, so here's the consequences, in other words, I will come as, on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And in that teal color, we have the succession arrangements. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So there's obviously so much information in these, uh, these letters and in the Church of Sardis, we're going to dive into a couple of the details here. And Jimmy, in this video, we are going to see that there's going to be a bit of recall from chapter two. In other words, some of the things that we have already studied uh, jump up again in this study. So those things we'll just refer back to our previous video and make just just uh, just mention of them a little bit in this video as we go forward. So some of them will be referred back to um, chapter two. But let's go ahead and dive in verse one. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, these things saith he uh, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. So here we have this, this theming. We're talking about this being the, the later prophetic period. What we're going to see in the later prophetic period is this idea of them experiencing a death. They're going in, they're about to go into captivity. Um, many people at that point was wondering, has Israel ended? You read the book of Lamentations and the what we call him the weeping prophet, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He goes in the book of Lamentations, how doth a city sit solitary that was so full of people? I mean, we just see this, you know, imagine the, the, this, this kind of the smoke rising from the buildings, this apocalyptic sort of vision. They, they thought maybe Israel was dead. They're, they're taken away into captivity in the Babylonian um, empire. And um, so we see this theming from here. And he says, this, this, these say the things, he that hath the seven spirits of God. What do we mean by the seven spirits of God? Let's refer back to chapter one and verse four, um, where we, we sort of see uh, these uh, the seven spirits. I, wanna, I just want to point out one thing, because I know we've already talked about this. You notice in verse number four, it says, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace be unto you, Peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, what's very interesting is the, the, the verb that is in chapter 1, verse 4, that is translated as are, is the verb esti. That's the Greek verb. What's interesting about that verb is it's a singular verb. Now, in English, we will say the word is. Um, if I say, this is a good book, is is always for singular. But if I say, if I'm referring to a bunch of books, I would say, those are good books. I wouldn't say those is good books, right? So is is singular, are well, is plural. So, uh, some people do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Improperly, yes, that's true. <laughs> I suppose people can do whatever they want. <laughs> that's true. Now, what's interesting here is in the Greek, esti is a singular linking verb. Um, so really what this is saying in verse four is it's the seven spirits which is before the throne. But because the word spirits is plural, the translators chose to use the word are so that it would flow better in English. But what's fascinating is it's translated from the word esti, which is singular. So that's that's a huge clue for us 
that these seven spirits are indeed just talking about the sevenfold ministry of God. So it's again that word that you know number seven is complete completion. And so we're seeing that this is indeed one spirit from God revealed in seven different ways. So would we consider this the Holy Spirit? This is the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yep. And we would, a lot of people say it this way, and I think it makes total sense. It's the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit. Okay. It's the seven ways he ministers. So, all right. He says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. So this, this idea of I know thy works— Think of the church of Sardis as the church that has a lot of programs. This kind of represents the sort of church we would see nowadays. Maybe a lot of people refer to as a mega church. The, the church of Sardis had things going on. In fact, that phrase right here in verse number one that says, thou hast a name. That's another way of saying you have this kind of reputation. You have a reputation, church of Sardis, and your reputation is for being alive. I mean, you, you go to this place and you just, it's, it's hopping. They've got ministries for everybody. Uh, you, you're not going to find a night of the week where there wasn't something. It's that kind of idea when you're reading in verse number one. But look what the Lord says. He says, thou hast a name that, that thou livest, that, that you're alive. You have this reputation for, for being lively. But what in reality did Jesus say? You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. And so we're going to call this the church that's sleeping. The idea of being dead is that they're dormant. They're not, um, they're not awake to the things of the Spirit of God. They are busy. Boy, there's a lot of application here, isn't there? Yeah, I'm thinking my mind's yeah. spinning as you say that. Yeah, yeah. We have to be careful that we don't lose ourselves in, our, in the busyness, even for the Lord. You know, I can remember going to Bible college, and, and our professors would often say, one of the easiest places to really get away from the Lord is in Bible college. And you're kind of thinking, how's, how's that possible? When you're in chapel three times a week, you have three different um, services for all the, all throughout the week, you're in church services, you know, seven times a week or whatever it is. And on top of that, you're in charge of leading small groups and teaching and you're on a bus ministry and you're feeding people downtown and whatever the case may be. How could you take that time and fall away from the Lord? Well, I'll tell you how. When you consider that you're in your Bible every single day for a grade, that you have to read the Bible through so many times and somebody's going to quiz you on it, and it becomes a rigor of, of, of production and of being graded and being evaluated, that you learn that almost Christianity has to do with pr productivity. And that's, you can lose, you can lose the idea of the gospel in that sort of a setup. And so, um, it, it, it's not good just to say that you're busy for the Lord so much so that you're asleep for the spirit of God. And so the charge for them comes in verse number two, they're given two, two admonitions here. Verse two. So he says, be watchful. R well, let's stop there for a moment. A watchman's job was to stay up all night. That that's where that word watchful comes in. You know, if there's somebody that's on a high tower looking out at nighttime, when you know, the army is asleep. That watchman's job was to see if anybody was coming in that they needed to warn everybody about. And if that guy fell asleep, they're in trouble. Well, this church is sort of like that watchman that's up in that tower that's supposed to be looking to see if the enemies are coming. And they fell asleep. They fell asleep, ironically, in their busyness. And so they're, they're totally asleep. They're, they're not watching for the things of the Spirit of God. So verse 2, he goes on to say, he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. So they're not dead. This is not a dead church. This is a sleeping church. So they have the, they have the reputation for being really, really alive. But Jesus says, but I'll tell you what you really are. You're dead. And it's a euphemism for you're dormant. And so the instruction in verse two is you guys need to be watching your sleep, verse two, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Not quite dead yet, but you're ready to die. In other words, you need to stir the coals, stir the embers of the spirit of God. You know, when we have a, when we have a fire, I just absolutely love sitting outside around some sort of a fire. It's just one of my favorite things in the world. And when you see those coals towards the bottom, especially if it's, you know, pitch black outside, you see those coals. Those coals are amazing because you can think that they're gone, 
and you go in and go to bed and you come back in the morning and sometimes you still see that thing smoking a little bit and you're like, man, and you go there and blow on it a little bit and you see after you kind of get those the ashes away, you can see there's still a glow. Those, those ashes are still alive. Those coals are still alive. This is the idea that Jesus is trying to get across in verse number two. He's saying, he said, strengthen things which remain. Think of those as, as coals. But also there's another idea to the coals analogy. If I were to take those coals from the fire, if I were to move a little piece of coal away from the rest, it dies pretty fast. But with all of them together, they feed off of each other and they actually protect each other and not losing as much heat. And that's the idea here. Strengthen the things which remain that thou art ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. I was listening to um, a sermon on this years ago. Uh, see if I can remember who that was by. Uh, I'll think of it. But but the man was saying that that there's an idea of being content with discontentment. And Paul talks about this in Philippians 4.11. He talks about, you know, that if I'm in this situation, if I'm in this situation, I will be content. And um, these folks here, they were content with their discontentment. And the idea of that sermon, it was Philip Kaiser, just came to my mind. Philip Kaiser's preaching on that. He talked about the idea of it not always being good to be content. And his point was, these folks in Sardis, they were content with being discontent. Because, Jimmy, they had the reputation. You have a name. They have a reputation for being alive. And sometimes when our, we have a reputation for things, Sometimes we're blinded by other things because we want to maintain that re- that that reputation in the eyes of other people. Well, yeah, if somebody's always singing your praises and and just yeah. talking you up all the time, you know, you can lose sight of you know what's really going yeah. on. Absolutely. You start what yeah. do they call that? You believe your own press. Yeah, that's right. Yep, absolutely. It's very easy. And then and then also once you have a reputation for something. You almost have to keep keep it up, um, yeah. Or you'll lose the praises of men, and that's not only a blind spot. Then you start actively putting energy into something that's empty, uh, reputation. <laughs> and really, if we get up each day and say, "Lord, how can I please you? How can I be emptied for you?" Very difficult to maintain a reputation if you do that. Yeah, so, that's good. So that's one of the things they have. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. That word "perfect," of course, means complete. It doesn't mean they're not doing any works. It's just that their works were fractured. They were doing some, they were busy. They were doing works, but they, they weren't complete in the Lord. And so this, this is the end of verse two saying, you're very, very busy for me. Um, but in this sense, you haven't taken the time um, to serve me. Look at verse three. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. So we have in verse one, be watchful. And now in verse three, remember. So these are the two admonitions that this church receives. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, there's that word watch again, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Again, um, I feel like we've said this so many times in the study, but I just want to point it out again. When the Lord's talking to these seven churches in the first century in Asia Minor, presently, as John is writing to them, he's saying, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't do this, I'm going to come to you. Nobody that I know of takes this as the second coming. I don't know any futurist, any dispensational that says that's the second coming. Well, why not? It's the same wording, but nobody takes it that way. In fact, remember our dispensationalist friends and most of our futurist friends, they actually make a hard line between chapter three and chapter four, saying chapters two and three are present day or or past for us now. And that invisible line in chapter four, that's way in the future, 2000 plus years. Well, why? It's the same wording. So my point is that all of us agree that this is not talking about the second coming, but it's the same wording. So what gives them the um, textual authority to pick and choose like that? The context does not require you to take it that way. All right, let's go ahead and look in uh, verse four. He says, thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not, which have not defiled their garments, they shall walk with me in white, and for they are worthy. This is the idea of a faithful remnant in verse number four. He's encouraging them 
that there are people that have not fallen asleep. There are people who have not bowed down before the throne of reputation, but there are people that have not done this and they have not defiled their garments. This is a, this is a huge theme in the gospel, not just in Revelation, but in the whole gospel. There's a huge theme of defiling your garments because Jesus clothes us in much the same way. Let's kind of talk about this for a second. So we have this theming of, 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 of a covering. Christ is our covering. So let's go back to the Garden of Eden. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they desired to be covered because they looked at their own nakedness and they were ashamed. And God had asked them, who told you you were naked? How did you guys find this information out? Well, they wanted to solve their sin problem by getting, the Bible says, fig leaves put together. And they sewed themselves clothing. They wanted to not be, um, they didn't want to be in their own form. They wanted to change their form. And so they took plants, sewed them together, and put them on. Well, what did the Lord, what did the Lord do from there? That wasn't good enough. It reminds us of Cain and Abel. Um, Cain wanted to offer plants. Abel listened to the Lord, and he killed animals. What did the Lord do? He took their plant sewing business to make clothing out of plants. He said, not good enough. There's no blood involved there. No, who's paying for your sin? And so he went and he slew animals because, you know, let's face it, animals don't volunteer their skin. <laughs> Something happened there in Genesis. And the Lord killed animals, took their skin, and he clothed them with it. Think about that. that this isn't from, you know, um, this isn't from, I'm trying to think of a store that would sell leather. Some, <laughs> would it be from the store to, to go buy a leather jacket? If I go and slaughter an animal and wrap you in its skin, you're going to experience the blood from that. You're, the blood is going to be applied to you. It's going to be on your body. This is a disgusting picture of sin. And so here we have Adam and Eve who listened to the serpent who was more subtle than any beast of the field. And they accepted his proposal. And so Adam and Eve became like beasts of the field. And so we have in the very first book of the Bible, the very first couple chapters of the Bible, we have this idea that sin puts us into a beast-like state. And so Adam and Eve took on the bloodiness of the beasts that were slaughtered, and they took on the identity and looked like the covering of beasts because of their sin. So we see this theming. We're going we're gonna to tease this out a little bit more as we go through Revelation. But you can see that theming beginning. You can see it in Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, he, he didn't listen to the Lord. And there comes a moment where he looks at his kingdom just like the Lord said he would. And he gets prideful and says, look at all that I've done. Look at all, this is all something that I did. And because of that, the Bible says he turns into a beast. He starts rooting around in the field. He starts grunting. He starts growing feathers and long fingernails and loses his mind. He becomes a, in a beast-like state. And Adam and Eve were our federal head. Adam was our federal head. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of Babylon. So we see these heads of nations, heads of representative groups that sin. They, they, they ignore the glory of God and they sin. And they become, in the Bible terms, beast-like. So we're going to see this theming many, many times. But here we have Jesus offers us in verse 4, he says, if you do not defile yourself, I'm going to provide for you a new garment. So Jesus provides a covering. He provides a covering. So his blood is applied to us. His blood becomes our covering. And so when Jesus stretches out his arms for the cross and the sun goes dim, he's a covering. He's a shade. Ecclesiastes says that your sin is made known. The sun can see it. Everything the sun illuminates is sin and it's vanity. Remember that idea in Ecclesiastes over and over again. The sun just shows his vanity. Well, when Jesus stretched out his arms, he's uncovering and he covers us and he provides a new garment. Remember the parable of, of the king offering for people to come and he goes to the highways and hedges after the, the immediate impressive people reject the invitation. And people come into the wedding feast and the punchline of that one is they're having all this fun and there's one guy in there that's off in the corner somewhere, and he doesn't have on the right garment. 
And so he says, Fred, how did you get in here? And the guy says nothing. So this is, pic- this is a picture of, of everlasting life. It's a picture of somebody trying to get into that party, that celebration, and they don't have the right covering on. And so he says, how did you get in here? And the guy says nothing. Well, we understand that because in, Reve- in Romans chapter one, it says that they are without excuse. And so they bind him ha- hand and foot and they bring him outside of where the party is. And then he goes and he lays, he's a cast out past where the lights can go. So that's called outer darkness past where the lights can go. And it says he's, he, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's anger. And he's taken away. That's the parable of this. And so Jesus here is saying, I'm going to provide for you. Verse four. He says, they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. Well, why are they worthy? Because they're overcomers. And we're going to see that theme throughout this. If you're an overcomer, then I will give you this new garment. You'll be covered by my blood. You'll be covered by my righteousness. And if you're covered, then you're in that salvation shelter we've talked about. And if you're in that salvation shelter we've talked about, then you're okay. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God hath not life. Just make sure you're in that shelter and you enter in by faith. And it's the grace of God that does a a regeneration type work for you. Verse number five. He says, he that overcometh, in other words, he that is in the garment, he that is in the salvation shelter, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That's the garment we're talking about. Then he says, if, if you're in this white raiment, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So here, and this is something I'll just tell our viewers, Jimmy, and I'll just share this with you. I think you know this. This is something that I've changed on over the years. I used to believe in something called once saved, always saved. And while that, while that sounds great and I, I like the idea of it, I used to believe, Jimmy, that if we got kids in for VBS or on our bus route or something, and they said what we call the sinner's prayer, sometimes we call it the Romans road. If I got them to say that when they were four or five years old and mean it, then they got saved. And we told them, you just got saved. And then we'd give them a Bible and write their name in the front and say what the date was they got saved on it. And then, of course, we would set up a day for them to get baptized. And they would say, you're saved and you're baptized. And I had, can't tell you how many people I've said this to. I would show them verses in the Bible I thought proved it. And I would say things like, nothing you do can ever take this away. Now I believe in something called uh, uh, security of the believer. And the contingency of, of eternal security, I believe now, the contingency is it's conditional is being a believer. I don't believe there's anybody on the planet right now that is saved that's a non-believer. In other words, if you got saved when you're four years old and then you go on at 11, 12, 13 years old and you live like the devil and you say, you know what? I deny the Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody were to ask you, you know, do you believe in the teachings of Christ? Say, absolutely not. I do not believe in the teachings of Christ then I think at that point you've walked out of the shelter. And that's why I love the Salvation Shelter imagery. We've said this before. Uh, Steve Gregg has said this before, and I just absolutely love the terminology. Salvation is not a commodity. You don't go to Jesus and receive salvation as a gift from him in the sense that it's an item. You know, salvation is is not a thing. You say, okay, I've come to the meeting tonight. I'd love to meet Jesus. He says, hi, I'm Jesus. I I just wanted to come to you to receive salvation. He says, I just so happen to have salvation right here. It's not not a commodity. He says, here you go. Here's salvation. You can never lose that no matter what. You say, great, thanks. You take it. You put it in your pocket. I can't lose it. I got it with me. Well, take care of Jesus. Bye. And you take salvation with you and you forsake Jesus. That's what I used to think. Salvation is not a thing. It's not a commodity. Salvation is a person. Salvation is found in Jesus. Salvation's in the shelter. If you leave Jesus, you leave salvation. So I don't think you can lose salvation based on your sin. We don't gain it based on our goodness either. It's based on faith. You would lose this, or I wouldn't even say you lose it, bad word for it. I would, you say you forsake your own salvation by your unbelief. You forfeit it. You forfeit it. You walk away from it. 
And in this case, that's what I see in Revelation 3. He says, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Well, the overcomers are the ones that are believing in faith, and they're the ones that are staying in that salvation shelter. And so he says, me, So let me sure. ask you this, though. Um, some may say this, I will not blot his name out of the book of life, means that we're, our name is in the book of life as we're born and, and over time, whether we become uh, believers or not then that name may get blotted out. But the way this starts off, it says, he that overcometh. And it, mm. is that overcoming? Does that even mean overcome the world and, and, and actually believe in me? Is that is that the overcoming part? We're going to find out later in Revelation the, the way they overcame. There's more information on it. But We're what if I need later. to know right now? Well, I'll tell you right now. Oh, okay. we're, we're, it's, I'll give you a preview. We're going to find out later the way they overcome was by uh, by the word of their test, by the blood of the lamb and of the word of their testimony. So that's that that is the answer. Then overcoming the is answer. believing in Jesus as your savior. That's right. For real. That's right. In in a word and in deed, uh, an authentic faith, an authentic faith. So that's and when your so, name is written in the in the book of life. Well, you know, we could dive into this another time because I don't want to wrap it too far in Romans th Revelation three. But I, but I will say that I, I I believe in the way that I understand the goodness and mercy of God. I believe that as soon as somebody is conceived, I believe that their name is written in the book of life, and they are safe there. If you want to say that word, not saved, maybe safe. I've heard that distinction with those that are conceived and written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Bible indicates that there is a there is a time period. You can read about this in Isaiah. Um, there's a prophecy in Isaiah where Isaiah tells somebody, uh, this is going to happen to you, but it will happen to you before my toddler son knows the difference between good and evil. Sheer Josh or something like that. And, and we can look at that story another time. And so it talks about this realization in, in, in children's lives where they, they start to transition from a child innocency into a state where they know the difference between good and evil. A lot like Adam and Eve had, and I think that's what the, the knowledge of tree of good and evil did. It, it catapulted them to a moment where they, they, they understood, oh, I can choose that and that's wrong and I still want to choose it. Um, they didn't need to have all the details to know that it was better for them to obey God. There's a simplicity of a, you know, a three or a three or a four year old, two year old can understand if they're being disobedient because they'll be sneaky to not get caught on something. So we know they have an understanding. That's how Adam and Eve were kind of like in that innocent state. Think of like a three year old for Adam and Eve. They knew it was wrong, but they had no idea of the ramifications of it. They knew just very straightforwardly. They knew that God said, don't do this. And that was good enough. And they they were disobeyed. So so that was that was their disobedience. But after they partook of it, then they started understanding the depth and the ramifications of death. And I think that when a child goes into that moment where, um, you know, I know folks, I know people can get saved when they're like seven. I know they can be, Jesus said, allow the little children to come onto me. This was an issue in the early church, by the way. You know, can children really have an understanding of spiritual things? Of course. Jesus said, allow the suffer, allow the little children to come unto me. But I think there's a moment where they're written in Lamb's Book of Life, and then all of a sudden they have an awareness of this idea of right and wrong. And God allows them the moment to reject him, to deny him. At that moment, they're blotted out. Now, here we're talking to believers. So these are believers that had their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he says, if you're an overcomer, an overcomer in this context is somebody who overcomes by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So their faith is secure in Jesus and they act like it. In other words, it's real faith. And, and in they sense, don't, and their they name don't, won't be blotted out. And they don't cave to the uh, persecution that these people right. were obviously facing at that time. That's right. That's right. Um, let's look at Jesus's clear words on this in Matthew chapter 10 and verses 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So Jesus says it really plainly. If you 
confess my name before men. And, and by the way, who would do that if you didn't believe in him? So this is talking about in, in thoughts that's associated with the forehead. I'm saying that specifically because as we progress in the book of Revelation, that'll make more sense. Thoughts and then in hand is deeds. So in both thoughts and in deeds, so believe in me and confess me, act like it, mean it, authentic faith. That's what those two things I mean. So Jesus says, if you confess me before men, then guess what? I'll confess you before my father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. And notice these are all in the present tense. It doesn't say in here, if you've at one point confessed me, then I'll always confess you before my father. Or if you at one point believed in me, you can then deny me. It's always present tense. If you're drinking from the living water, he that believeth in me, it's always present tense when we're talking about salvation. So I believe that what we're talking about in Revelation 3, although it may be somewhat controversial with some, I believe what this is talking about is those that are in the salvation shelter, as we've talked about on our channel before. If you're in the shelter, if you're in him, then you're in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you overcome the chaos of the storm around you by staying in the shelter. If you walk out of that thing and you you have no protection from the shelter at that point, you're not protected from Jesus if you're not in Jesus. Abide in me and I in you. To anyone who hasn't watched that episode, I, I highly encourage it. Yeah, hopefully it'll make, make that case a little bit stronger. He ends it in verse 6 by saying, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So again, we've said this last time, just because you have an ear doesn't mean you're getting this information. There are plenty of people who read the Bible and hear exactly what we're hearing. But you have to have humility. Come before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be able to hear these things. Let me have an ear to hear these things. And so there's a humility involved in this. Okay, let's go to the church in Philadelphia. Well, Ken, real quick, I noticed that this church, Sardis, was all reproof and no praise. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to see some um, some pretty staggering things as we look at Sardis. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of good things. It, you know what's ironic about that is Sardis was— um, Man, they were they were jumping. I mean, they were hopping from the Lord. If you walked by there, you'd say, man, they, again, their reputation, you have a name that you're alive. So that doesn't, that doesn't mean that just because you're doing a lot of things for the Lord, just because you're making teachings on YouTube, <laughs> just yeah. because you're producing content, just because you are, you have a church and you have outreach this night and that night, and man, I'm just producing all these things. If your heart is not is far from the Lord, then it's it's meaningless. Yes, Jesus was like I, that. Don't impress me much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. We can't impress him outside of being fully obedient to his spirit. If you like this video, hit that like and subscribe button, and check out the full episode by clicking the link below.